right, so my old friend is this guy named Danny Grininger. Very easy to pronounce last name. All the way from Denver, Colorado, which is a place I love. I've, I've actually stopped by his shop many times when I've been uh, in the area and uh, times where I've had to uh, make like random conference calls. I'm like, can I use your conference room real quick? Uh, super nice guy, very helpful to our industry. He's done a lot. He's kind of came from an engineering background. So he came into this little screen printing world and decided he was gonna engineer his way through it. And because he's done that, he's created great ways of, uh, of printing water-based inks and all kinds of different techniques that are really helpful to our industry. So very excited to hear from our old friend, Danny Gruninger. All right, guys, uh, first, before I get started, I just wanted to uh, give a big shout out. Johnny, Tom, Brett, SGIA. Um, you know, it's really cool that we're, we're all here together. We've got Virus, we've got Matsui, we've got m &R, we've got Rock, we've got all these guys coming together in one room. And it's, uh, for me, it's, it's really cool to see that happening. Um, you know, we're, we're here to help, we're here to educate, and, uh, you know, more than anything, I just wanna hopefully give a little bit back to you guys today. Um, so I'm gonna start off, tell a little bit about my story. Um, like Brett mentioned, I came from a, a background of engineering. Um, I grew up in a, a machine shop making uh, paint guns and automotive parts and all kinds of really cool stuff on a CNC machine. Um, when I was 19, I decide, decided to start uh, printing t-shirts. Um, got into it with my brother. We, uh, we kind of, you know, a lot of years, those first years we struggled. We were, uh, we had one manual. We really didn't know what we were doing. Um, and that really pushed me into learning the whys and the, the R&D side of the, of the business. Um, so I really dive deep into, uh, you know, figuring out who are, who are the guys in the industry that are doing stuff that other people aren't doing. And, you know, Mark Coudre right here, uh, Frankie V, John Wise, Andy Anderson. You know, there's a, there's a whole lot of guys out there that they inspired me. They inspired me to, to uh, carve out a niche that most people weren't doing. You know, the local screen printer was printing plastisol ink through a 110 mesh and, you know, really thick bulletproof prints. And I'd go out and I'd see these other prints that these guys are doing and they're blowing my mind just so cool so good so i really tried to path out and uh you know go go down the path of we're gonna we're gonna build a business model that separates ourselves from the guy down the street from us um fast forward 10 years 12 years later um we scaled the company right now we we have four automatics um about 80 heads of embroidery um, at one point, we were doing garment dyeing. We do garment sewing. So we, I'd say we're kind of a small factory. Um, we, we've scaled to about 50 employees. And uh, right now, we're a 100% water-based shop. Um, so that transition going from plastisol to water-based um, was really kind of an industry-defining thing for me to prove that, hey, I can do what all these guys before me did, but I can do it with a different set of inks. Um, so today, fast forward a little bit further, about two years ago, I had a couple guys come into my company and, uh, at the time I didn't know they were, uh, two really sharp business guys. They had a clothing brand that they started right out in Denver, Colorado, right down the street from me. And they said, you know, we're tired of dealing with contract decorators. We're tired of printing with somebody and then getting the shirts and folding them on our kitchen table. We really need to vertically integrate. We really need a solution for our garments. Um, so my partners, they make their garments out of recycled plastic bottles. Very similar to what Ryan started with All Made. And uh, they came to me and they said, you know, Danny, all our decorators, they're printing Plastisol ink and they're putting it on our shirts that we're making out of plastic. This makes zero sense. Um, so we started talking, they realized, hey, Danny's built a company that can do everything that we need it to do. Why don't we just see if we can buy his company? 
A um, couple days went by, they asked me if I'd be selling, I said make me an offer, and about eight months later I sold the company. Um, so today I'm the general manager of Denver Print House. Does anybody follow Denver Print House on Instagram? Okay, cool. Um, so if you see any videos on there, that's just me rambling around the shop, taking videos, taking pictures, um, as we're just doing our, doing our day to day production. Um, so really the why for me and the reason why I'm here today is I found a purpose. I found a purpose in the blanks that we use and um, you know, guy, guys always ask me all the time, why did you switch from plastic saw to water base? And you know, really when I walk in the shop and I see a shirt going down the belt and I feel it and I touch it, that makes all the difference in the world to me. It completes our story. So we're making a, a ethically responsible blank and we're putting ink on it to complement that. Um, so that's really, you know, kind of my background, my story. I really love R&D, I love innovating, I love developing products, and uh, I'm here to help industry kind of move forward. Um, you know, Beppe, Jesse, you guys, I use your ink, you guys make amazing ink. Um, amazing, amazing stuff out there. All these guys, they're here to help you, and that's, that's really what I'm here, I'm here to help you guys, I wanna share my story, I want to make you guys realize that you can be a printer that goes from Plastisol to Waterbase and be successful doing it. Um, Ryanette, they're, they're another uh, really big influence in why I'm here today. Um, you know, Green Galaxy, the ink line that Ryanette sells, it's always kind of had a bad rap of, you know, these, this is a hobby shop ink. This is an ink for the manual printer. It's only good for guys that are got one printer in their garage. And you know, I really looked at that and I'm like, you know, I, I, I don't believe that. At one point I was the underdog. There were guys telling me, you're never gonna succeed. You're never gonna build a successful business. And I feel like here I am today, Ryanette, he's always had my back. He's always been there to support me. So my connection with him is I'm here to support Green Galaxy. I'm here to put that name on the map and make people realize it's, a, it's an ink for everybody. It's not just a hobby shop ink. Um, so that's kind of my background. And, uh, you know, Colin, he's up here with me. Uh, when Colin got hired by Ryanette, it was one of those things I, I was super excited. And I was super pumped up because I know his history, his background. This guy's like a chemist without being a chemist. He loves inks. He eats, breathes, sleeps it. This and, place is fun. And he's kind of the intermediary that I have to the ink manufacturer to continue to develop new product. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about my background. Yeah, and, for, uh, those, for those who don't know, uh, I've been in the industry since 96, uh, bounced around a lot. I still remember the first shirt I ever unloaded. I still remember the first design I ever registered. Uh, I've been doing uh, art and separations since about 99. Started with push buttons and worked my, way, worked my way up from there. Mr. Kudre, thank you so much for everything you have done. I have learned so much from you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and then bounced around a little bit. Ended up at QCM Inks back in 2006. I was technical sales. I know a couple of you here uh, from when I was there. And uh, while I was there, the chemists were my friends. So I always had a chance to sit down and talk chemistry, the why for everything. Uh, Roy Wielden was the chemist at the time, and he was a guy who was as eco-conscious as you could be within the plastisol industry back in 2006. Made his own biodiesel, put that in his converted biodiesel Mercedes, had soy, -based, soy products in his ink, as much as we can get away with. Everything we did was a forethought to how it was going to react in the environment and in your body. When the... Uh, CPSIA uh, phthalate restrictions came into play, we were already done. We were done years before because he had already decided, I don't want to use that stuff. So that's where I come from in this industry. That's my background uh, in there's no need to be nasty. There's no need to be, you know, have stuff in here. Oh, it works. It works great. Yeah, but in 10 years, you're going to have issues. You can already see your skin degrading from touching it. So that's where I come from, and that's why I'm really jazzed to be a part of this, be a part of Ryanet, and be a part of uh, promoting and working with Green Galaxy and Acutex Minerva. It's, 
I smile. It's, this is fun. So guys, I want to talk real quick. Um, transition from Palacisol to Waterbase. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you my first major failure story that I still lose sleep about this all the time. Um, so, you know, we're, we're a Plastisol shop running four autos. We're doing a lot of really high quality work, simulated process, 10 color, 12 color. Um, and we got really comfortable with the methods and the processes that we were using with Plastisol. So, you know, I decided to go in I, and I saw somebody online. It might've been Eric, it might've been somebody. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, it was probably Beppe actually. You know, Beppe shows up to all these trade shows and he's got the most phenomenal work in the world. And it just pushed me and pushed me and made me realize that's where I want to be. By the um, way, Eric does some amazing stuff too. Yeah. We all love you, Eric. Um, so anyway, my first major failure, I go in and I'm thinking, hey, I, I know what I'm doing. This is easy. I got this. We're going to put ink in the screen. We're going to print like we've always printed. And... Uh, Problem to make a long one. story short, I get a call from the client a week later and they say, why, is, why did the 800 hoodies that I bought from you, all the ink is washing off of it? And I'm like, no, there's no way. You know, we know what we're doing. I we did everything right. We, we sat down, we thought we did everything right. But really when I looked back at it, my approach was just so wrong. It was so bad. You know, when we're printing Plastisol inks, we're, we've got fans in our shop. We're blowing ink on pallets to try to cool the ink down, to try to maintain our pallet temperature. I've got ink flooding across the screen at a paper thin level, just no ink flooding across the screen. It's drying. I've got a fan blowing on it. And, you know, looking back Oops. at it now, I'm like, what, what the hell were you doing? You didn't know what you were doing. And my point to this story is, all these guys in here, Colin, myself, Beppe, Jesse, just reach out to us. We're here to help you. If, if, if I would have done that when I went into it, rather than thinking, hey, I already know this. I'm good. I'm, this is easy. I was so wrong, you guys. One call to any of these guys, they're going to help you out. They're going to tell you, make sure you put more ink in your screen. That was one of the biggest failures that I had. So the point of that story there's resources, there's help. Don't think you're too good for it like I thought I was. Go get some help and ask for it. And don't be overconfident. This, this ink, while it's, we all say it's very easy to use, we're saying that after getting that foundation and understanding. Once you're there, it is. It's easy to use. Absolutely. Like Colin said, now in our shop, we're running water base all day, every day. And I would not have it any other way. It's, I feel like it's easy for us. Um, but you have to adapt your processes. You cannot take the same approach and the same mentality. So that's why I share that story. Um, another, I want, I want to share one more story before I go into what we do at Denver Print House on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so a success story that I had. Um, I don't know how many, how many of you out there have heard, if you're going to print water base, mainly high solids or medium solids, you need... Um, multiple underbases, multiple color screens to be able to do that. Nike swoosh, um, green. Yeah. Screens so guys, there. everybody, I, everybody always told me, oh, I was in a shop in Honduras and they were printing a little Under Armour logo that was bright yellow. And I, and they had to print eight screens to make a bright yellow logo. Blocker, flash, blocker, flash, blocker, flash, white, flash, white, flash, color, color. You, you name it, I'm thinking, this, this isn't what I want to go down. I'm used to printing a white base, flashing it, printing a color on top, and it's good to go. So a success story that I had, I called Jesse up and I said, man, I'm, I'm struggling here. and I'm struggling printing like I printed with Plastisol. I want to be able to mix one ink, put it on a screen, print it on a white base, and have it look bright red like a fire truck. And Jesse said, you know, I'm not going to tell you how you can do it, but I'm going to tell you, you can do it. You're a good printer. We've got products. Play around with it. Go test. And that's what I did. So Jesse, major thank you to you to push me to that level. Um, so I went, I went in. I made up screens. I mixed up some ink. I put it on the press. 
my red was pink. And I'm thinking, this is not, this is not what I want. I start playing around with additives, pigment loads, ways to print differently. I took all the plastisol approach in my head and I threw it out the window. Maybe two or three hours later, I'm calling Jesse and I'm saying, hey, dude, I've got a perfect print. I'm single stroking, I'm running one screen. Um, everything that I heard people in the industry tell me that I couldn't do, we just did. And it held up in the wash. And, uh, you know, so that was one of my first really big wins with Waterbase was, hey, we can print this stuff like Plastisol. Don't let people tell you you cannot. Throw out all of what you've learned and just start diving in and r and and developing yourself. So that's what we did. Um, so a couple failure, success, running into a shop that's uh, trying to convert, you're gonna have that. Um, you know, don't get down on yourself, keep going, keep pushing and realize you're doing it for a reason. You're doing it, my reason, blanks, ink, you know, every time I saw that shirt come off the dryer, I felt good about it. Um, so just have a purpose with it, don't give up and just keep moving forward. Um, let me get my notes out here, sorry about this guys. Um, so what I wanna talk about now is just our transition at Denver Print House from Plastisol to Waterbase. Um, the first thing that I suggest everybody, everybody does is go back to your shop and take a look at your environment. Figure out how your shop is set up. Do you have fans? Are you blowing ink across your shop? I mean, it's a really common sense approach, guys. When you have standing water on the floor and you take a leaf blower and blow on that water, what's it gonna do? It's gonna evaporate, right? So if you have air moving across your shop floor, all it's gonna do is make it harder on printing. Your inks are gonna dry. Um, so, I, I tell everybody, check your environment, make a list. What can you do to improve your environment? What can you do to improve your shop? Um, I look at these inks as, you know, it's, it's, it's water-based ink to me is like a, a fine wine or a fine cheese. You know, you don't just crack your, your cheese open from the wax and eat a piece and let it sit there I, forever. I squish the grapes, it's wine now, right? Right, you've gotta take care of it. You've gotta nurture it, you've gotta protect it. Um, so with the mentality of we're looking at inks as you know, a fine food product, a similar relationship there, make sure your shop is clean, you know? There's so many print shops that I go into and it's like, really, you guys are printing in this shop like this? Clean it up, you know? Make it clean, keep your airflow down, bring your humidity level up, get all the tools to measure that stuff. You know, we're, we, print at, we print in Denver, so we're, we're a mile high, um, really low humidity, uh, about seven to 15% on average. What we had to do in our facility was introduce uh, moisture. So if you guys follow us on Instagram, you see the videos I post, we've got fogging machines. Fogging machines, you don't need them. There's no ink out here that needs a fogger, but if you have an environment that has more dense air, it's a lot easier for the ink to stay on the screens rather than go up into that air. Um, so that's a, that's a couple just suggestions. Look at your environment. It's different than printing Plastisol. Make sure your shop is clean. Make sure your ink room is tidy and clean like a kitchen is. And, uh, you know, just understand your environment and what's going to happen with evaporation within that environment. Yep, exactly. Um, you know, and sometimes it, you'll need to adjust. Sometimes you won't. But after a little while that you've actually been able to see how your ink behaves in your shop, you'll know whether or not you need to increase or you're fine or whatever you need to do. It's, it's a there's a learning curve. There's definitely I mean, I, I would suggest I don't like to see humidity levels that are above 70 percent. For us, we found the sweet spot is around 40 to 50 percent for us. Um, you know, it's going to be different for everybody, everybody's environment. But you want to have a little mechanical advantage in your air. Um, like I said, it's not needed, but it's definitely helpful. So just know your environment, adapt your processes and take, it, take the approach that you're starting over. In a um, low humidity environment, you'll be fine. You'll just be working a little faster. Yeah. 
Um, the next thing that I want to get into is our art department. So uh, a few of the changes that we made going from Plastisol to water base, uh, for me it was really, uh, I, guess, I don't know the right word for this, but it was for me to go tell our artists, hey you guys, you can throw out those gutters. You know, the traps that we are using for Plastisol, we don't need that with water base. Water based ink is so much more refined. You know, when you're printing water based ink, you're not running into dot gain. I mean, how many guys out there are printing a 10 color simulated process and you watch your third color go down and by the time it's at the end of your order, it's a smushed out mess. Guys, with water base, we don't have that. These inks are so much better. When they hit the, when they hit the under base, they're not going anywhere. So what we had to do with our art department is, we had to retrain our artists to throw out all that Plastisol band-aids. You know, gutters, when we're butting up artwork together, we butt it right up against each other now. We don't put a gutter in our under base because our colors are bleeding together. Throw all that kind of junk out the window. These inks are better, they're more refined, you can run tighter cut tolerances in your art room. The evaporative nature of the inks makes dot gain far less, as well as the dimensionality of Plastisol when you lay down your base white. You know, we're just gonna say it looks like a Lego, you know, has a, some dimensionality to its edge. White ink being evaporative, it'll take that thickness of ink deposit and shrink it down. As a result, your overlapping traps can go from one point down to half a point. For those using Plasticol that were at half a point, you can actually go down even lower. And just because that evaporative nature, you don't need anything to overlap and trap, given that you have tight registration. Yeah, so, you know, uh, one thing that we did making that transition from Plasticol to water base was the first thing that I wanted to learn was, what is my dot gain? What, what uh, if, if I, print these inks on a Plastisol set of separations, what am I gonna get out of this? And what I'm telling you from my shop, this is gonna be, and, and a disclaimer, big disclaimer for everybody here, I'm speaking of what works at Denver Print House. What works at Denver Print House might not work for you, it might not work for somebody else, but it works for us. So I'm gonna share that information and you know, you might be able to take it and run with it. Um, but for us, we found that when we printed water base inks, high solids, through a Plastisol separation, we were losing at minimum 20% of our dot gain. Um, so what, that, what that's gonna look like on a shirt is if you've got a red and a yellow transitioning together to blend an orange, to make an orange gradient, you're gonna see a lot of white area in there with the water base. Um, so we had to go in, I developed a, a curve for all of our Plastisol separations. Once I figured out the difference of printing a Plastisol dot versus a water-based dot, we went in and we re-engineered a curve for all of our separations. Um, like I said, for us, it was around 20% through the, through the whole mid-tones of the, of the print that we had to boost the separation up. Here's a, another way of looking at it. How many people here print on paper? Okay, so those of you who have printed on paper or are aware of printing on paper, Printing with water-based inks is very similar in the dot gain that you'll get if you do any offset printing or anything like that. We're talking about closer to 20% dot gain, where with Plasticol, a good printer will be closer to 30, but you're looking at, you know, prepare for closer to 40% dot gain. You almost have no dot gain within water-based printing. The better you are, the less you'll have, and that's what he's talking about. He has to compensate in those areas where we're normally pulling things way back because of the curves that he's created for actually printing his dots onto his screens, he now has to increase all of that by over 20% to compensate for what he's been doing. So he's actually putting more dot back in, putting, you know, taking that 50% value and making it closer to a 60 or 70 in order to get the correct tone once it hits the, the shirt. And again, this is more of a mindset of paper printing than it is t-shirt printing. Yeah, guys, so the whole, the, the whole thought is your art department, you've got to relearn a few basic things. Traps, chokes, gutters, dot gain, it's going to be different with water-based inks. So my, my suggestion is test. You know, if you run virus, call Beppe. He's got so many years under his belt helping people with this very set of, you know, curves and dot gain. Jesse, we're all here. We're all here to give you guys those tools but just know that it's different. Um, it's almost what you see is what you get. 
And, and, and really that going back to that R&D side of what I love about this, water-based inks, they're so much more refined, guys. There's nothing that's come through my shop that we cannot do with water-based that we were doing with Plastisol. I feel like our simulated process is better. I feel like our four color process is better. I feel like our special effects are better. Um, so just stick with it, keep going. You're gonna have to R&D on your own. What works for me not, might not work for you, but just stick with it and don't give up. Just keep R&Ding to figure it out. Um, the next thing that I wanna talk about going from our art department. And another thing that's really cool is Waterbase gives your artists so much more ability to create really cool graphics. Um, you're gonna see it on one of our designs tomorrow. Beppe does a lot of it where depending on the, the under bases, you're creating a lot of tonality with the colors that you're printing on top of that. So your artists, they can play around with a lot of variable under bases to really create some new appeal to designs that with Plastisol, you really couldn't get that look with them. Um, so it's, for me, it's, it's a pretty fun transition moving to water-based inks. Um, screen room, that's where we're gonna go next. So at Denver Print House, we've really streamlined what we use as far as mesh, mesh selection. Um, we've got three meshes that cover 95% of what we print on the shop floor. Um, you know, a little bit different than a lot of other guys, but this works for us. And uh, the, those three meshes we use are a 150-48 thin thread. That is primarily used for all of our white inks, um, our under bases, and our, a lot of our um, really fine shimmer type inks. Um, so that's a really good all-purpose mesh that we use every day across the board. Um, we use a 225 40 diameter mesh. That is what we put on 99% of our colors. Um, so if we have a, if we have a job, what's that's your EOM? A, what's that? What's your EOM? Um, so EOM that from transitioning from Plastisol to water base, we, we eliminated some of our EOM. Um, so depending on, you know, what we're printing, if we're printing a simulated process print, we're typically around 12 to 15% EOM there. If we're really trying to push it with a higher LPI, I always like to drop that down some, maybe eight to 10% on EOM. Um, for our standard prints, definitely a little bit less EOM than Plastisol. You know, we don't need that, that gutter on the, the bottom side of the screen to really fill the ink up with. We don't need that. We need a nice thick flood across the screen not a really heavy flood like you do with Plastisol. It's a little bit different. So just keep that in mind when you're printing water-based versus Plastisol. We're not trying to push ink into your stencil like you do with Plastisol uh, with the water base. It'll flow and cut easily. So you, you, that's why you have your uh, flood bar up a little higher. Plastisol needs that little extra, little extra help. Yeah. Um, so, you know, going back to our meshes, three meshes, 150, 48, 225, 40, and we run a 122 thin thread um, for our blocker bases. You know, we heard Jesse mention how important blocker under bases are. In our shop, we print blocker under bases all day, every day on a lot of garments. You know, we print a lot of poly, we print a lot of tech fabrics, we print a lot of digital camo that, has anybody printed digital camo in here? Has it, bit, has it, it bit you in the ass with, poly ink and plastisols and I mean, it would bite me in the ass almost every time. I would print a plastisol blocker, I'd print a layer of poly ink, I'd come in the next day and I'd see the digital camo pattern. That does not happen with water-based blockers. Water-based blockers are so much better. Um, in my opinion, they mat the fiber better and it gives you a lot better surface to print on. Um, so blockers, shimmers, special effects, we go through our lower mesh, our whites, and you know, if we go direct to fabric with big areas, um, 150, 48, all of our colors, half tones, 225, 40. Um, we don't run high LPI line counts, guys. There's guys out here that are running, you know, 101, 81, they're doing phenomenal work. For us in our workflow, we run 55 line count, guys. 55 line, 22 and a half, just like you do with Plastisol. 
and we build our inks to print like plastisol. So that's really what's cool about what we're doing with Green Galaxy and, and uh, what you can do with all these guys' inks is you can build them the way that you want to build them. You know, of course there's recommendations, there's uh, TDS, all these guys will help you get a foundation, but play around with it yourself. You know, change, change the formulas, change the recipes. You're gonna learn, you're gonna find something that you know, maybe a manufacturer hasn't hit on yet. Just keep continuing to develop, but Water Base Inc. gives you that platform, which I really love. Um, screen, so we talked about the screens. A lot of people ask me, what emulsion do you use? And... You've used them all. I've used them all, but what I tell everybody is I, I'm all about the double Ds, guys. So it's durability and detail or definition. If you've got an emulsion that will not hold up, you put, it, you put it on a screen and your stencil breaks down 40 pieces in, 50 pieces in, that's, that's no good. I look for an emulsion that I can put on the press and I can run 20,000 prints on. Um, you know, our facility, we do, so, sometimes we get into big runs, 50,000 units, 40,000 units. I wanna put a screen on press that I know is not gonna break down. All these guys have emulsion to do that. Um, find one test with it, keep, keep testing, make it work in your environment and stick with it. Um, so yeah, durability and detail. All right guys, so I'm gonna go in and talk a little bit about our ink room now. Um, like I touched base on earlier, the mentality has to change for you guys. This is not plastisol. We cannot leave lids off buckets. You've got to think that this is, I'm working in a kitchen here, okay? I keep it clean. I keep lids on buckets. I've got a sink there. Um, you know, it's, it's a lab to me. It's, it's no longer just an ink storage room. It's a lab. So what we do in our lab, keep it clean, keep it organized. Um, constantly rotate your pigments. That's a big thing, guys. You've got pigments that are sitting in a container. Pigments are heavy. They're gonna, the, the solid of that pigment is gonna settle to the bottom. Every day, go in there, shake it, rotate it. You need to love your water-based ink a little bit more than you love Plastisol. Um, you know, white ink. White ink is one thing that, uh, that we really care for in our shop. Uh, what we do when we, have a, when we have a job on our press, we're printing white ink as our underlay or maybe our highlight white. When that job gets done, where, do we, where does that white ink go? It doesn't go right back in the bucket of our fresh ink because that's just gonna screw up our fresh ink. So what we do at DPH is we've got two five gallon buckets in our, um, in our I guess our cleanup area is what we call it. Um, so when a job gets done on the press, our, our uh, screens get stacked on a cart with the ink buckets. They go back to our cleanup area. We have two five gallon buckets of white back there. We fill the white ink that's been worked on the press into those buckets. Every single day when those buckets get halfway full, they get taken back to the ink room and we fill up the rest of the bucket with fresh ink. Then it goes back on our ink mixer and we're re-blending that ink. We're rejuvenating that ink. And what's really nice about it is, guys, a white ink that's been run in production and then mixed with fresh ink, that is an amazing white ink. You know, as much as we would wanna give you a white ink that you crack the bucket open and you put it on your screen and it's amazing, that is pretty hard to do if you wanna recycle your ink. Um, it goes back to the whole evaporative nature. There's a balance there where you can only get down to a certain level and you don't want to add water. It's, it's a zone that you need to be in that you'll learn over time. And guys, we don't add water to our inks. You know, there's some guys that will add water. I don't like to add water to the inks. I mean, you know, they are water-based inks, but if I'm gonna freshen up an ink, if we have a job that we're printing and it's, we're printing 10,000 shirts and I see that ink come off the press and it looks a little bit dry, it's a huge mistake if you just add water in that ink and think that you're gonna, re -bring, you're gonna bring that ink back to life. That is not happening, guys. That is a huge mistake. Trust me, I had lots of issues, so 
Write that down in your notebook. Don't rejuvenate your ink with water. Take some fresh ink. Take some ink that you've already mixed with your, uh, with your base. It's, it's got some pigment in it. Blend that ink with your old ink, okay guys? Um, so a, a big thing in the ink room, keep it clean. Get yourself a good scale. That is one thing with water-based inks. You've got to have a good scale. Um, you know, even, even in our shop, I've got a mediocre scale and I'd be lying if I didn't say I struggle with it sometimes. Get a really, really good scale that goes out three, two or three decimal places and uh, you, you can link it into an inventory management. Um, so when you make an ink, put a barcode on it. Put when you made it, track that ink. Make sure that you don't have an ink sitting on your shelf that's four or five years old. If you do, you probably don't wanna use it, guys. Um, so track your ink, have a good scale, keep your ink room clean. Um, really kind of basic common sense stuff, right? But a lot of people don't do it. It's water-based, I can add water. No. Don't add water, take think your- of it, Think of it more as a solvent ink than a water-based ink, you, you know, there's discussions. And it's, it's about mindset and how you approach it. If you hear water-based, you go, oh, I can just add water. That's not the, the best thing to do. It's you want to go back to uh, something else or refresh it with an actual ink itself. So we're kind of making our way through our shop. We started in our art department. You guys heard that that's changed. Our screen room, not a whole lot's changed there from Plastisol. Um, our ink room, it's definitely changed from Plastisol. We care about our inks, we love our inks. Um, and now we get to press setup. So where this differs um, from Plastisol, one thing that I like to tell people, guys, we're dealing with really refined inks. We're dealing with inks that can do anything you want with them. Make sure your press is calibrated, right? I mean, this is common sense again. If you've got a press that's not calibrated, you're probably not gonna get the results that you should be getting. You know, when virus sends you a four color process separation, they're relying on you guys to have your press calibrated. If you've got pallets that are all over the place, it's not gonna work right. That's just, it's common sense, guys. So if you wanna be a successful water-based printer, calibrate your presses, maintain your presses, and uh, you know, give, give, give the inks, I guess, a, a mechanical advantage there. Yeah, I was gonna say, follow a lot of the same processes that you will for dialing in for doing sim process, where we don't need to worry about screen tension. Uh, we do need to worry about everything being in plane and tight registration on your press. Pretty standard stuff. So when we get ready to go to the press, um, one suggestion, suggestion that I have and what helped us a lot when we were first starting out, we would put our screens up on press and we would lubricate them before we would drop inks to them. Um, so we would take a little bit of softener or retardant, mix that with water, put it in a spray bottle, spray our screens, wipe the image area before we put ink on the screens. That way when we drop ink on the screens, our ink isn't hitting our fresh mesh and drying in the open area. There's a coverage already there, okay guys? Um, that, was, that was something that really helped us when we were starting. Another thing was when we drop ink into a screen, we're dropping it outside of the image area, okay guys? So I'm moving my tools back a little bit and I'm putting my ink behind my image to where I'm not just dropping it right on the open area, I'm dropping it behind the open area. Um, and that way it gives me time to heat my pallets up, get my pallets where I need it. You know, we hear a lot of guys talking about pallet temperature. It's key with water-based inks, guys. For us, we like to be around 135, 140 degrees. Anything more than that, you're gonna start trying to dry ink on the screen. Anything less than that, you're not gonna evaporate what's on the pallet. Um, so I like to get our stuff up to 130, 140 degrees, let it cruise and keep it there. Um, Water-based inks that I've printed and that, that we're currently using, they like a little bit of heat. Um, don't be scared of it. Get those pallets hot. Um, get it up to cruising speed and start printing. As the ink actually hits the platen, the heat from the platen is evaporating the ink itself. And most of us are double stroking the majority of our colors. So that first base, that first layer that goes down, it's evaporating a little bit, getting a little tacky. 
Next layer comes down and it's building a little bit more opacity and color as a result. Flash, go into your colors. Your color goes down, chills just a little bit. Next one goes down and then that heat is still there and still active. So we're getting, so the platen itself is acting as a flash, an evaporative machine. And then it goes into the next color, it's still evaporating. And this is where the wet on dry printing comes into play instead of the wet on wet printing. So that's where board temperature and managing your platen temperature is very, very important. So going back, we've got a job up on the press. We're getting ready to run it. Um, standard procedure for our shop is our guy gets three to four scrap test shirts on the press. Our pallets are already warm. We've got ink on the screens. And guys, this is really where pre-press comes into play. Dial in your pre-press. There's no reason why with Trilock, with PRUs, with CTS and reg pallets, there is no reason why we are registering on a press for more than five or 10 minutes. With the tools that are out there, you guys should be locking screens in, having the confidence that they're in the right spot and you can get your test print done. You might need to crack a micro here or there, but pre-press is so key with making this flow in your production facility. No change from Blastisol. No change, it's no just change, standard guys. standard approach to quick setups, changeovers, minimal downtime. Um, and uh, I think we're out of time. Yeah. We're pretty, okay. Sorry about that. There, so there's a lot that I didn't get through. Um, you know, feel free to ask us questions. Feel free to come up and, uh, you know, get a little bit of insight as far as what we do at our shop. Like I said, the disclaimer is what works for us might not work for you or what other guys are um, teaching, but you know, we're a, we print a lot of shirts. We do over 10,000 shirts every single day and we haven't had Plastisol hit a screen in over a year. Um, so if you, if you guys want info, come grab me. I'm more than willing to share, more than willing to share a lot of my failures and uh, yeah. yeah. As you can tell, we're all a pretty open and friendly bunch. So yeah. All right. Thanks guys. All right, thanks Danny.